Hey guys, this video is sponsored by NVIDIA and MSI, so stick around until the end to find out more about the GeForce RTX 30 series laptops. When it comes to the Quake series, I don't think you're going to find a more divisive bunch of games, with each entry being vastly different from the last one, and the opinions from fans also different greatly. Its Software's first entry in the iconic franchise was a challenging, violent, fast-paced shooter that in some ways kind of felt like a natural progression from Doom. Replacing demons in a portal to hell with monsters and Lovecraftian entities split across different dimensional gates. The action shifted from 2D sprites to fully 3D models and also included mouse look, jumping, much more elaborate environments, not to mention the leap from MIDI to CD music. And after playing this, you'd really be foaming at the mouth to play a sequel, wouldn't ya? Which is kind of what happened back in 1997 when id Software followed it up with Quake 2. Now, I can't think of a single person I knew who didn't like this game when it came out, and yet despite that, over the years it's gotten this weird, undeserved reputation as being a bad game or something, which I'd argue is said by mostly people on Twitter who weren't even alive when it came out, or are just parroting that opinion from someone else. And it's always kind of been funny to me how Quake 2 is so disliked for being so different to the first one, and yet Quake 3, which easily has the least in common with the first game, seems to get a free pass. Impressive. If anything, you'd think it'd be more popular now, especially after Doom Eternal, simply because Quake 2 was the first game that Marty Stratton worked on. Yeah, you know, the same Marty Stratton who, along with Hugo Martin, we've got primarily to thank for Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal. <laughs> thank you. Awesome. Either way though, I've always thought that Quake 2 was a really solid sequel, and that's a hill that I'll gladly die on any day of the goddamn week. I feel people who simply hate on it for not sharing enough similarities with the first game, or for more even inane reasons like the lack of a muzzle flash, need to reevaluate what they think makes a game good or bad. Now, I'll be honest, the real reason I wanted to make this video was to talk about the ports for Quake 2, the one on the Nintendo 64 and the PlayStation. But to first understand why those are so impressive, let's get a few things clear about the base game. You know, before Night Dive Studios remaster it and everyone suddenly becomes a fan. Yes. Right, so released way back in 1997, it's probably no secret that Quake 2 wasn't even originally supposed to be a Quake game. And that kind of makes sense given the all new setting and premise. The gothic, medieval, and fantasy-like environments of Quake were replaced with industrial and utilitarian locations on the alien planet of Strogos. Factories, warehouses, buildings, and structures that were fully automated, with moving platforms, elevators, and machinery, leaving the player feeling like a small piece of meat moving across that metaphorical production line. Like a starship trooper being sent to the planet of Klendathu to take on the bugs, you're fighting back against a malevolent, cybernetic alien race intent on taking over the entire galaxy. And in typical id Software protagonist fashion, you're just a lowly grunt, one of many fighting back against the Strog and moving around the inner workings of the planet like a mouse behind drywall, eventually making your way to the palace and even defeating their leader which also then went on to set up the events in Quake 4, and I think this might be the only Quake game to ever actually set up a sequel. And along with Half-Life and Unreal, it's one of those early shooters that strayed away from the level-to-level -level format and instead had you completing objectives and working towards goals. In a lot of ways, I think you can almost look at this as a very early example of the military shooter format that became much bigger in the mid-2000s. You know, where in those ones you'd always end up becoming the one-man army responsible for saving the day. Quake 2 really marks that turning point where shooters were now having actual campaigns. They were putting you in the middle of a much more fleshed out and detailed location and giving you an actual purpose, instead of just running around and looking for the end of the switch. It's also funny too how the other shooters on the same engine also help to do the same thing, you know, if you really stop to think about it. Soldier of Fortune, Kingpin, Sin, and yes, even Daikatana all had campaigns with an overarching storyline, with different characters, scenes of dialogue, and changing goals. I'm prepared to scour the earth for this motherfucker. Quake 2, though, is really one of the first examples of this, and I think along with Unreal and Half-Life, it helped to lay the foundation for these style of shooters moving ahead. 
This meant you'd often have to run back and forth across different maps, often multiple times. And yeah, I mean, I guess on some level I can understand how the extra brain power required to remember something as basic as where to put a key card could be deemed as challenging. Plus, it's also one of the first games, I think, to really popularize the railgun in shooters. And if there's one thing that we should be thankful for first-person shooters giving us, aside from shotguns and giblets, it's definitely railguns. Visually, the Quake 2 engine looked and sounded amazing at the time, allowing for much more detailed maps and modeling for enemies and weapons. You could even damage enemies over time, seeing them become more bloodied and injured the more damage they took. I also think it's a game that you have to play with the texture filtering off. I mean, there's something about the smoother look of texture filtering here that just makes the game feel less grungy. That also goes hand in hand with the music, which is just incredible, composed by Sonic Mayhem. There's a heap of awesome tracks in this thing with these shredding guitar riffs to really get you amped up. And I think their undisputed masterpiece here is Descent into Cerberon. A song so catchy that most people don't even listen to the lyrics, but they should. Quake 1's soundtrack immersed you into the environment, whereas Quake 2's immersed you into the role of a badass. And while both of them are good, it is kind of funny how people are going to suck Trent Reznor's dick until their tongue is swollen, but you'll never hear those same people praising Sonic Mayhem. In fact, they'd even argue that it holds up against the stuff that Bobby Prince worked on in the original Doom. And if you ever need a more perfect example of how different in tone Quake 2 is from the first game, well then just put these soundtracks side by side. Now, I said earlier how I thought that Quake was an evolution of Doom's mechanics. Well, in that way too, I think you can look at Quake 2 being an evolution of Quake 1's. I mean, let's look at the basic stats, right? The first game had roughly 15 or so enemies, whereas Quake 2 has upwards of 20. The Light Guard and the Enforcers are really the carryover from the grunts in Quake 1. They're weak, lowly ranked enemies that are easy enough to deal with, but can be dangerous in high numbers. And now there's different variants that can carry different weapons. Gunners are an evolution of the Ogres, where instead of firing a single grenade, now these guys are able to fire off four in rapid succession, along with having a minigun as backup instead of a chainsaw. Also, if you're playing on a higher difficulty, the chances are you're going to see them avoiding incoming attacks. Instead of just one aerial enemy in the form of those annoying fucking scrags, Quake 2 on the other hand now has three of them. Four if you include one of the bosses. Plus, the enemies are just a lot different in design from the first game. Now you've got these horrific looking mechanical monstrosities, deformed amalgamations of flesh and steel. If you ever stop to really check out the texture work on these creatures, it's pretty cool stuff. Uh. A really underappreciated example of good body horror that they really built upon in Quake 4. Uh. You also get all these hints of the kind of creatures that they fused with, from mechanical to even reptilian. A lot of these enemies now also prefer to attack you from range, compared to the monsters in Quake who would often just beeline straight towards you, often making explosive weapons and splash damage a serious threat. I mean, with the rocket launcher in the first game, you were pretty much just signing your own death warrant at times. And on that note, if you want to talk about the natural progressions even further, well, then there's no better example than the differences in the weapons. Starting off with the blaster, a weapon that is so fucking useless it doesn't even really function as a portable light source. I'm still on the fence though as to whether or not it's as bad as Quake's axe, I mean that thing couldn't even chop up a piece of soft cheese. I think the blaster wins simply because it's ranged, but either way they sure made sure they nailed the feeling of your fallback weapon being about as effective as a warm stream of piss. After that, you've got a shotgun and a super shotgun, with the super shotgun, again, pretty much trumping the basic one completely, making it almost redundant. I want to say too that we also need more weapons in games to have handles on the top of them. It just makes the super shotgun look so effective and reliable. It looks like I could take this thing out all day and use it to hammer down railroad spikes, and then use it to kill things, and it'd still hit dead on center every time. Instead of the nail guns, you've got a machine gun and a chain gun, and both of these are actually kind of useful in different situations. The machine gun's handy for just peppering the weaker enemies with a constant stream of bullets, plus there's something I've always loved about its understated sound effect when firing. Do you know what I mean? It's like this weapon has no pretensions about what it's put here to do. 
Plaza might be one of the first FPS weapons I can remember that had any kind of simulated recoil. Fire, 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 fire. Then the chain gun is just good for killing whatever's on the other end of the barrel as quickly as possible. It's about the closest I've ever gotten to feeling like the T-800 at the end of Terminator 2. And the short stints you can fire this thing full auto without restraint is the stuff that boners are made of. I, I wrote a blog post a while ago about why I hate video games. Because this is what it does, it appeals to like the male fantasy. The grenade launcher and the rocket launcher, again staples of the Quake series, both make a return here, and the slower firing speed of the projectiles now makes them much more skill based, and less just about spamming them like crazy. Plus I've always loved how this is like the only game in the entire series that has polygonal explosions. Why no one else has ever done this is anyone's guess. Instead of the Thunderbolt from Quake, you've got the Hyper Blaster, which is more or less just the plasma rifle from Doom. It's even got that slight delay before you can fire it again. And of course, they managed to work a BFG into this thing too, if you can find it, which also easily holds its own against the OG from Doom. God damn! In fact, I think this version is actually closer to the one from Doom Eternal, with a slower moving projectile that fires out these little tendrils that attack nearby enemies. I already mentioned the railgun before, but you know what? It's worth mentioning again because I don't think it's possible to give this thing too much praise. It's easily one of the best weapons in the game, not to mention one of the best weapons of all time. And the sound this bad boy makes when firing is about as close to the sound of an instant erection as you're ever gonna hear. Oh my god! And again, this might be the first time we ever saw a railgun in an FPS game. I do know that Shadow Warrior had one too, and that both games came out in 1997, so it's kind of hard to know who came up with that idea first. And you know what, outside of the lack of muzzle flash, a complaint which is kind of piss weak considering the multitude of things these weapons do well, I've never quite understood the dislike towards this lineup considering it's really just the same as the first game but improved across the board. It just feels like every weapon here has more of a purpose. I mean, while the super shotgun is a great weapon for taking out your run-of-the-mill enemies, you're obviously going to find it less useful against someone like the tank commanders or some of the more agile flying enemies. I just feel like there's more room for experimentation. Compared to Quake 1, where you spent 90% of the time with the super shotgun, outside of the other 10% where you either use the super nail gun or the rocket launcher. One of the criticisms I can get behind though is the flatness of the environments, which does kinda make sense given the premise and the location. I think the color palette is definitely lacking compared to the first game, and there is a sense of being stuck on this barren shithole rock of a planet. But again, that's really kind of the point. I mean, this ain't a sightseeing tour. And I think any real criticism of the Quake 2 engine is kind of selling the whole thing short. I mean, like I said, this engine really laid the groundwork for some of the best of the old school shooters. Without Quake 2, we wouldn't have had Soldier of Fortune, Kingpin, Sin, nor Daikatana. Son of a gun! And quite frankly, I don't want to know what life would be like in a world where those games don't exist. Not to mention some of the best mods of all time, with things like Action Quake, without which I'd argue Counter-Strike would never exist. Oh. Ow! So overall, I think Quake 2 deserves more recognition, and its status as an important entry in the history of the genre is something that just gets way too overlooked. And finally, speaking of overlooked, that brings me to the point of this video. Finally, motherfucker. The ports for Quake 2. <laughs> now I've finished Quake 2 more times than I can count, and although I do love it to bits, it's one of those games that's starting to feel way too familiar. So this time when I went for another playthrough, I also thought I'd add the console ports to the list. And it kind of dawned on me that these ports, along with Quake 2 in general, haven't really ever seen all that much love throughout the years. Seems like there's been new versions of Doom coming out every couple of years, and last year Night Dive Studios remastered Quake, but the only real main remasters we've had for Quake 2 outside of unofficial source ports was the Nvidia RTX re-release from a couple of years back. It's hard to not just see this as a ray tracing tech demo because it really does show off the possibilities and the potential that these older games can have when ray tracing is added with an actual modicum of effort rather than just chucking the feature on a game willy nilly. But as far as the PC is concerned, I mean, that's about it. What's also kind of weird is that if you bought Quake 4 for the Xbox 360, you know, in which case if you did, we should be friends, you'd probably remember that Hidden Away on the Bonus Features disc was a really good remaster of Quake 2. 
And I think it's safe to say that for a lot of people, especially for those people whose first console was the 360, this would have been their first introduction to the series. I didn't even know this version existed until I started doing research for this video and I'm flabbergasted. Yes, flabbergasted that more people don't know about it. I mean, it not only controls pretty smoothly with that Xbox controller, but it's also one of the first games for the platform to run at 1080 resolution, not to mention at a pretty smooth 60 frames per second. It's actually kind of crazy how good the console ports for Quake games have been. I mean, even with the ports for Quake 3 on the PlayStation 2 and the Dreamcast. Excellent. I can only imagine the amount of work that must have gone into bringing this remaster to life, and yet, for some reason, you hear so few people talking about it, compared to people bitching about Quake 4. Prior to this though, your only way to experience Quake 2 on the consoles was with either the PlayStation or the Nintendo 64. Now, this also wasn't the first time that a Quake game made its way onto a Nintendo console. Way back in 1998, Midway Games took a stab at a Nintendo 64 port for Quake, taking a similar approach to it as they did with Doom 64 a year earlier. That being a completely revamped soundtrack and much more of a focus on the horror-based aspects of Quake's design. For some reason though, this version of the game got really bad reviews, with reviewers often claiming that it was just an inferior port of the PC version, which obviously it is, I mean no shit. But I always found this to be a bit of a weird criticism, because I don't think that this is a version intended for people who had already played it on the PC. I always kind of assumed that this was intended for people who didn't have a PC at the time, so the Nintendo 64 was the only platform they could get it on. And if you look at the whole thing from that perspective, I gotta say I don't see all that much wrong with it. Still controls pretty well with that 64 controller and has more or less the same levels. A battle that has working against it is the frame rate, which can be pretty damn crappy at times. Plus you're also expected to beat entire levels without dying as there's no manual save options. And that's a bit of an issue because the levels weren't really designed to be finished in a single sitting. And it kind of makes the game a lot tougher than it should be at times. But the new soundtrack, I think, makes things pretty interesting. Not to mention, you've got all that new coloured lighting, which changes the tone of the levels entirely, making them look like something out of a Dario Argento movie. Night Dive Studios even included a mod for this version in their recent Quake remaster, which is just beyond based. And it's all up just astounding that they got the whole thing running to begin with. So, who better to call on for the Quake 2 port but Midway Games? Which is what happened again in 1999 when they needed someone to port the game across to the Nintendo 64. You can definitely tell it's been worked on by the same people just from that intro movie alone, again showing the game's logo as it's covered in various enemies from the game, all of whom fire their weapons towards the camera. Yeah, where have I seen that before? Then the ending screen once you've beaten the game kind of reminds me of Doom 2, showing this gallery of all the enemies along with their death animations. But now, clench that sphincter and remember that there was also a Quake 2 port for the PlayStation. And to make it even more confusing, this one was developed by a group called Hammerhead. And this, I think, is where it starts to get interesting, because aside from a few minor similarities, these are both vastly different versions of the same game. To the point that it really is like playing through two entirely separate campaigns. Seems like Midway Games took all that criticism to heart about their Quake port not being unique to the platform, so this time they went right ahead and just made a bunch of all new levels, which comes in considerably shorter than the PC version. Roughly, I think about half the size with only 20 levels compared to 39 on the PC. I mean, you will see some familiar looking areas here and there, but by and large this campaign is completely unique. Also like Doom and Quake 64, old mate Aubrey Hodges again returns to create an entirely different soundtrack. Though, for some reason, this time under the pseudonym of Ken Razor Richmond. Now look, the only Razor I've ever known is Razor Ramon Sumitani. And I think if that guy ever did the music for a Quake game, it'd definitely be a lot different to this. Overall, it does work well, but I'm just not sure if it kind of fits, and there is definitely something missing here without Sonic Mayhem. What's probably most unique about this version though is that the level flow is entirely linear. Unlike the PlayStation 1 and the PC port, you're really just moving through the levels here in a more traditional sense, finding key cards and often objective items before making your way to the end of the level. There still isn't any kind of manual save option, but it does have a really complex password system, much the same as Doom and Quake 64, where the game's able to keep a tally on what level you're up to, along with the weapons you're carrying and your other basic stats. I'm still in awe as to how this thing can be so accurate, and it's a definite godsend if you're lacking a memory pack. 
There's also a lot of really cool looking environments here. One of the last levels is this giant freight elevator that you're moving through, and it's a pretty impressive visual trick here to make the whole thing seem like it's constantly moving. It's also definitely much more colorful than the PC version. The level set in the mines, for instance, had this bluish hue, which is completely different to how the same environment looks on the PC, where it kind of felt that time like you were taking a tour through Satan's butthole. But it's the final level that's had the biggest change, I think, because now instead of fighting the Macron, you're instead taking on two tank commanders and a Hornet, having to defeat all of them before the exit route becomes available. What's most important though is that Midway Games understood that this game is designed to be played with a controller, which means unlike Quake 64, you don't quite need to aim up and down so often, with enemies often being on the same level as the player. Most of the enemies are also included too. I think about the only ones missing are the medic and the technicians, which ain't that much of a deal anyway. I mean, both of those things are about as annoying as having a wasp inside your dickhole. I think you only encountered the medics a handful of times in Vanilla Quake, and those technicians were little more than just floating barrels. This sure as shit though doesn't make Quake 2 any easier, and it's still a pretty damn challenging game. More so because you're often having to deal with a pretty choppy frame rate, and yeah, imagine that, a Nintendo 64 game that runs like ass. Oh, big surprise. <laughs> Having said that though, I actually think it's one of the better looking and performing games for the platform. <laughs> GoldenEye and Perfect Dark have this weird sort of messianic status amongst Nintendo fans, despite the fact that both of those games now look and play like utter shit. Quake 2, in comparison, is easily much smoother and has a much sharper image quality. Definitely has areas that perform better than others, but it's a damn sight better than the single digit performance you'd often get in Goldeneye and Perfect Dark. Oh Being accurate with single shot weapons like the rocket launcher and the railgun ain't as hard as you'd think it would be, you know, as long as you're not epileptic. And on the plus side, they also managed to add in actual muzzle flash, so there's really not that much to complain about here. I love too how when you're now holding the BFG, you can see the bottom of the player's hands glowing from the radiation coming off the weapon. It's kind of like the briefcase in Pulp Fiction. And yeah, maybe don't hold that thing too close to your nutsack, you know, if you ever want to have kids. Actually, I actually think it's kind of neat too how this port has this kind of immersive heads up display, where you can have the HUD fade out if you want to when you're not in combat, you know, to make things more engrossing I suppose. And you know what, in fairness, playing video games on a CRT television in a dimly lit room is still way more immersive to me than half the modern day crap that gets pumped out for the Xbox and the PlayStation 5 these days. Overall, this clearly had a lot more work put into it than the Quake 64 port has, you know, in case the entirely all new set of levels wasn't a dead giveaway. Plus, like all Nintendo 64 games, it has the option of up to four player multiplayer matches, the kind of thing that both created and ended friendships due to screen cheating. And I'll be honest, right, at first I didn't really think too much of this port, but the more time you spend with it, the more you can really appreciate the work that's gone into bringing it to life. From a technical viewpoint, just getting the whole thing running in the first place, but just the way they've tried to implement all of these other mechanics to make it feel like its own thing. Then you've got Quake 2 on the PlayStation 1, which is kind of like a weird combination of both. I mean, it sticks to the same level design of the PC version, being objective-based instead of linear, only the environments are mostly just condensed versions of the original. And that again, my friends, is a pretty phenomenal technical achievement for the console, considering how it barely looked like the PS1 could run Doom at times. Now this thing right here is the reason to own a PlayStation mouse, and why I say that is if you're trying to play this thing with a controller, you'll see that it really has one of the worst control schemes in any first person shooter I've played on the platform. Normally I can find myself getting used to control schemes over time, but this one is just so backwards that even I have my limits. This came out before even Medal of Honor or Alien Resurrection came along and helped to make the thumbstick controls commonplace, so it includes a control scheme that's just downright archaic. So get a load of this right, the left thumbstick moves you forward and aims left and right, while the right thumbstick strafes left and right and then aims up and down. Now it might not sound like a huge deal, and it really is a minor difference, but if you think about that layout, I mean, really stop to think about it, it really just makes this thing borderline unplayable. It's kind of like trying to suddenly write with your left hand if you've spent your entire life writing with your right, or, you know, vice versa. And honestly, I don't even think I'd recommend playing this unless you somehow get your hands on a mouse. Yes. That's how bad it feels. 
Bruh. With the mouse set up, you can hold the controller in your left hand to move and strafe, and then just aim with the mouse in your right. And yeah, I guess that's also pretty clunky, but it's a damn sight better given the alternatives. Once you get past that though, you'll see that this is again also a really impressive port. And it captures that perfect mix of chunky, wobbly polygons from the PC, combined with that dithering effect that the PlayStation was known for, making the whole thing seem even grungier, which I can really get behind. There's even this new bit in the detention center where one of those poor captured marines has scrawled kill me into the glass wall of his cell, which is just metal as fuck. But more importantly than that though, is that it includes Sonic Mayhem's soundtrack, keeping the game in line with its PC roots. It's grungy, pixelated, and rough around the edges. You know, exactly what you want. He ain't lying. For a game that's set on a hostile planet where you're fighting cybernetic aliens. And there's just something so charming about how it's this massively downgraded version, and yet it still tries to keep up with its more powerful brethren. I don't know, man, something about that just feels so endearing. Now, if you played the PC version, you're again gonna see a lot of familiar looking areas, but they've also managed to include a few new ones as well. For starters, the game now opens with this entirely new series of levels, which are unique to the PlayStation 1. And all up, there's again 20 levels in total, split across five missions. They've even managed to keep in most of the boss fights, and more importantly, the Macron for the final showdown. Though, it does seem like this version is a lot tougher. I mean, his BFG attack this time around just seems to melt your asshole in nanoseconds. Fucking piece of shit! It's just for memory reasons, a lot of these environments are split down into much smaller chunks. And when you're backtracking through these units, you'll be staring at loading screens every 10 seconds. Manual saves still aren't a thing here, but instead you get save points at every major level transition, and you can abuse this as much as you want for unlimited saves, you know, if you can be bothered. You are one pathetic loser. Then if you die at any time, you've got to reload from your last save file. Even able to resupply and get full health and ammo if your last save file left you with your proverbial pants down. There's minor gameplay modifications too, with items now being instant use. This, I think, is probably due to the limitations of the controller. But again though, it ain't that much of a huge deal, because half the time in Quake 2, I forget to use my items anyway. And then, whereas the Nintendo 64 took enemies away, Quake 2 on the PlayStation 1 actually adds them in, with the new enemies, the Arachnid and the Guardian. The Arachnid is about the closest we'll ever get to seeing an Arachnatron in a Quake game, and this thing is an absolute bullet sponge. Able to soak up 1000 points of damage, making it as tough as a tank commander, and the second toughest of all the non-boss enemies. Yeah. Shit. God damn! To piss in your oatmeal even more, it's also got a railgun as its primary attack. You don't encounter them too often here, but you're gonna remember every single instance, because they're a pain in the ass. The other enemy is the Guardian, which is an entirely new boss fight, and this thing looks like Ed 209 from Robocop and is able to soak up 2500 points of damage, making it the second toughest enemy in the entire game aside from the Macron. Much like Quake 2 and the Nintendo 64, this is just a shorter compressed version of the base game, but I don't think that's a bad thing because, again to me, it really seems to be a game that's aimed at people who didn't have the means to play it on the PC. I don't think you can say that one version is better than the other because they both play to their strengths here and there's so much that they both do uniquely that it's not fair to write either one of them off. I think the PlayStation 1 version definitely looks and controls the best only because you can't compare aiming with a controller to aiming with a mouse because the controller's going to lose almost every single time. Plus it's also added in a bunch of little visual effects like a lens flare effect which is kind of charming in how bad it is. You know what, with both versions, I'd still argue that they're up there as the absolute best of the best when it comes to the first person shooters on their respective platforms. I just hope when Night Dive Studios get around to eventually remastering Quake 2, because let's be honest, that's gonna happen, that they're able to include playable versions of both of these ports, like what they did with Quake 64. I think over time, people are going to eventually come around and give Quake 2 the credit it deserves. I mean, there's so much revisionism on the internet these days that it's bound to happen. Just remember though that when that day finally comes and everyone on Twitter is suddenly a fan of this thing that it was me, poor old G-Men Lives, who was one of the first ones to raise a flag here and fight in the game's defense. Now if we could all just get everyone on the same page with Quake 4, then the stars would truly be aligned. <laughs> right, so thanks for sticking around and now that I've got your attention, let me tell you about MSI's new B12UX laptop. 
forget about tinkering with different configurations, the B12UX is a one-stop rig with plenty of performance. You've got an NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3070, an Intel Core i7-12700, and 32GB of DDR4 RAM running at 3200MHz. Yeah, shit. That NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3070 also comes with all the 30 series trappings, including immersive ray trace gaming and DLSS to ensure the performance is up to snuff. Plus that Max-Q technology bus performance without turning the laptop into a bulky brick that sounds like a jet engine. This thing is also built for 1440p gaming, so it makes sense that the B12 UX comes with a Quad HD. Which makes it a lot prettier than those other ones out there still rocking 1080. Makes for a great mix of fidelity and FPS for offline gaming, and that 164Hz refresh rate gives you that competitive edge for those who want to get a bit more sweaty online. And if you're not keen on playing games with a mouse and a keyboard, well, the B12 UX also has a console mode for easily playing mobile games with a controller. If you want to know more, well, click that link in the video description for more details.